John Cash from UR Energy, the Russian-Ukrainian war uh, is impacting uranium. I don't know where to start. How about you tell us what's happening with the uranium market? Well, we have to recognize that Russia is by far the largest refiner of uranium in the world. It's also very important to note that they have control over a significant portion of the uranium mining in Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan provides about 46% of the world's feedstock uranium. So uranium, uh, the Russia is a critical player in uranium mining and conversion services and enrichment services. They are the gorilla in the room. So when they invaded Ukraine over a year ago now, that really threw into question where are supplies of refining services and uranium going to come from? And so Congress has recently taken action uh, towards sanctions to cut off that supply coming out of Russia into the U.S. That's a real game changer for the industry because we rely in the U.S. and in the Western world so heavily on those supplies out of Russia. So that's called into question uh, the uh, supply chains. And right now, utilities are scrambling to find out how do we replace Russia should the U.S. Congress finalize the uh, sanctions on Russia. So it's a real game changer for our entire industry, Tracy. Is Russia then redirecting their uranium to China? Can you comment on that? That is the speculation. And certainly is a concern globally is where do those refining services go? And it does look like they're probably going to be heading more and more toward China. As evidence to that, because Adam Prom recently signed an agreement with China to sell a significant portion of their production into China. And Russia has also uh, recently gained control, or not control, but 49% control of one of the largest projects in Kazakhstan. So it looks like you've got kind of a trilateral uh, group of countries here, China, Kazakhstan, and Russia that are working together to kind of corner the market when it comes to all things nuclear. So yeah, Russia is a key player there as well as China and the feedstock is going to come out of Kazakhstan. Oh, So let me ask you, does the U.S. have enough reserves? Can we actually handle our own uranium if we just buy from Americans? Unfortunately, no. We've got some good deposits in the U.S. Uh, we are blessed to have two of those that are production ready and going into production, uh, but there is no way that U.S. producers could fill that gap. We're going to have to rely on allies like Australia and Canada to help fill that gap. Same story true with the refining services as well. We've got a really good converter here in the U.S. with Converdyne that's ramping up but they're not going to be able to supply the entire U.S. industry. Same is true with the Urenco and its enrichment plant down in New Mexico. It's not enough. We need more. And Congress is taking steps to uh, pass legislation to fund the expansion of those. But we're going to need help from our allies, especially in the near term. We just finished at the Critical Minerals Institute Summit. We were talking a lot about government support to help companies mm -hmm. in the critical mineral sector. Of course, uranium is a critical mineral in all five major jurisdictions, the US, Canada, Australia, the UK, and Europe. Can you tell us, uh, you know, I'm certain uh, that the US government is calling you for advice and wisdom on how to do this. Can you tell us what advice you might have shared with the US government? Yeah, so first and foremost, we need to support the utilities. And that has been largely done through the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, there's some great tax credits and other things that are being directed toward the utilities to support them, to generate more carbon-free electric, to move into the hydrogen arena as well. And so that's great. And, and we've been pushing the U.S. government for that. We've also been pushing for an expanded uranium reserve where the U.S. government would be buying from U.S. producers to build a stockpile. Uh, so we're protecting our utilities. So they've got those supplies there. And at the same time, we maintain that infrastructure and capacity here in the U.S. We're also pushing for uh, HALU development uh, with the U.S. government and respond, responding to uh, RFPs from the Department of Energy. So trying to advise them on how to establish those programs so that we can move forward with development of that fuel, which will be directed towards small modular reactors going forward. So 
a lot going on in the nuclear space in the halls of Congress right now. You know, you have been a terrific leader. And, you know, over the, the last several years, we've worked together with you and Energy Fuels to educate mm -hmm. the general public about how uh, uranium is actually one of the good guys. Nuclear <laughs> energy is one of the good guys. We've seen a huge decrease in the environmentalists and activists coming after us. Yeah. I want to ask you if you're seeing the same thing. Yeah, you know, we really are. Uh, as we've gone through permitting on of our projects, we're kind of getting to the point now where uh, many of the environmental groups understand what we do. They understand we're producing a fuel that goes toward uh, zero emissions electricity, and they appreciate that now. They understand the importance of that. We utilize the in-situ technology. Our footprint in the field is very small. Uh, if you drive through our mine, it's hard to even tell it's a mine. It looks more like a field with beehives in it, and those beehives are the wellheads. So yeah, we, we see very little opposition anymore because more and more environmental groups say we've got to go carbon free and nuclear is really the only solution. So we get more and more support, it seems like, all the time. Well, John, as always, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing some of your endless knowledge and expertise on the uranium and nuclear market. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy.